Hi everyone, today we're talking to Roz the Recruiter in part one of the series, How to Level Up in the Workplace. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to Sister Circle's speaker series for this month where we are hosting Roz the Recruiter from Y'all Hiring Podcast. Listen, if you're not already listening to her podcast, please subscribe. She's on all of the major platforms. It's called Y'all Hiring and I absolutely love it based on some of the things that she talks about. I'm going to get Roz in the room. Hi, Miss Roz. How are you? I'm good. How y'all doing? Fabulous. Listen, good. So I was just giving a brief introduction to who you are, like in addition to being the head of talent acquisition at Warner Media, home of Insecure and like a whole bunch of <laughs> other entertainment brands. You are the host of Y'all Hiring. And I was just telling them like, absolutely love this podcast. Like give us the clip notes to like your background, how you got started as a recruiter, how long you've been doing it. Oh, okay. So you're asking me to age myself publicly. Okay. <laughs> um, my background is, is pretty simple. Um, I, I've been in recruiting for 15 years. Um, and that's that's just, it's probably longer, but I'm going to use, use 15 because it sounds nice. Someone was like, hey, you're good with people. You should consider a career in recruiting. I was like, oh, I can recruit athletes all day. What are we talking about? Basketball recruiting, volleyball. And she was like, no, technical recruiting. And so I had never heard of this career field. Didn't even know it was an option for me. Had lunch with her and then started my career as a coordinator out at Microsoft. So since then, you know, I've moved my way up in the industry. I've worked uh, IBM, Uber, Slack. Now I'm at Warner Media, And most recently, uh, I moved into media tech, uh, which has been uh, exciting and so fulfilling. And then, as you mentioned, I, I have a podcast. And so along the way in, career, in, in recruiting and with my career, I've met some amazing leaders, peers, um, and recruiters. And and um, as I was looking for a way to, at the end of the year to really scale myself, to be able to help more people, to be able to respond to more questions, um, I hit up my girl Shauna with this problem and she was like, podcast, let's do it. And I was like, okay. Uh, and within like two weeks, her and some more people flew out to Seattle and we had our first uh, workshop. We just kind of brainstormed through what it was that we wanted to accomplish, who do we want to impact, um, and, and most importantly, we wanted to be authentic and we wanted to be truthful. To be able to not just say, oh yeah, I made it, I did great, but what, like, what was that really like? What was making it, what, what did getting here take? And so that's what we try to do with the podcast. So I hope you all are enjoying it. Raj, you have a video out on YouTube, and in this video, you talk about a lot of us have been told that we need to lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps. So talk to us a little bit about like what that myth is and, and what you've experienced on your end. So yeah, so oh, that was a heavy talk, and how we came to that, I was trying to figure out what to talk about for this particular conversation at the Lesbian Zoo Tech Conference. Uh, it was for the New York Summit. I had actually written an entire presentation on something totally different and was planning to speak to that. And then I don't know if you all remember, but earlier that same year, this quote from Dr. King started going viral again. And it was when he was at the Ebenezer uh, Baptist Church and he was saying, uh, the, the reporter from NBC News had asked him a very arrogant and rhetorical question that was, you know, around what is it about the Negro? Uh, considering every other immigrant in this country has been able to sort of pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Why can't the Negro do that? And Dr. King had way more patience than I did. I tell you, because my response would have been like, fuck, what, fuck you. Um, but instead, he responded so eloquently, and it just it, it hit me so hard where he said, you know, to to ask a man, you know, a man, a bootless man to pull himself up by his own bootstraps is just cool and just. And I remember thinking, holy shit, that's what they ask black women to do every day, uh, especially in this tech space. What, how I was trying to position that conversation was, we are not uh, the impact, the children of uh, a former CEO, so we don't have nepotism in our favor always. Uh, we all aren't going to Ivy League because we aren't legacy there, right? So it's hard for us to get into those schools. And the, the, the amount of us that do get into those schools, it's middle school compared to uh, our white counterparts. And so to say that in the tech space or in media or in any industry, that it's a meritocracy and we're all as good at, <laughs> however hard you work is going to be uh, what you can accomplish in life is simply not true. And so- American dream, right? The, the falsehoods of the American dream, yeah. right? 
So if we're going to compete in that environment under those uh, those terms, how do we do that? Well, we got to create our own fucking boots because we don't have any. And so there were some things that I've learned along the way that I wanted to share. And, and it was it was really how we can uh, come to the table more knowledgeable uh, when it comes yeah. to things around advocacy for yourself in the workplace, uh, you know, negotiating your your salary offers and really finding sponsors versus mentors um, to really help uh, apply some of that boot mentality to the game. So going back to your bootstraps, you talked about, so there are a few ways that we can help ourselves. And one of them is resumes. Um, answer this for me, when it comes to cover letters, do they really work? Are they needed? Like, what's your opinion on all of that? You're going to get me shot by so many of my industry peers. It's about to be shots fired. Uh, cover letters. They're, they're absolutely not necessary. However, if you are in education or looking at government jobs, you will not be able to apply to one without them. They, they still are like mandatory parts, the job uh, application process for those industries. The thing about cover letters in 2020 is uh, no one reads them. Uh, I'm going to be honest. When I see resumes with them, I move right past it and go right to the resume. And I guarantee you a lot of recruit on this call does. They do the same thing because no one has time to read them. For a smaller, if you're applying to like a startup, right, where there is there is someone who has the time to read that cover letter, it might be um, applicable. But if you're applying to a large company, I wouldn't put as much emphasis and time on the cover letter as I would on my actual resume. Okay. And then for someone who's maybe been in the job market for a long time and they they have a they have ideas of what their resume should look like that might be antiquated like what do you consider to be like important to include on a resume like like when it comes to jazzing up a resume you know a lot of people might add color and it's like but are we really doing that and does that matter yeah so let me just give this first tip it's really important that your resume and your linkedin profile match that's the first thing mm -hmm. I'm gonna say, and I'm gonna say that because as a recruiter or even as a company, the first, one of the first things we do when we see a resume, we go to look for that person on LinkedIn okay. every time. The other thing I will say about resumes, when you've been working for a long time, you're you're emotionally connected to the work that you've done and you wanna include all of it because that's my work, that's what I've done. I will say recruiters and hiring managers that are reading resumes are looking for relevancy. We're looking for, uh, I don't want to say keywords, but we're looking to see what you did, how you've impacted, how you grew, something that relates to what I want you to come here and do. If you just have a standard resume doc that you never touch when you get ready to submit it to an organization, that's probably not the right way to do it. You can have a standard doc, but depending on the role that you're applying for, uh, you might need to tweak some things, especially if you are uh, working in fields like program management, product management, even design, I'm going to say, because those tend to be standard things that we, we, we collect over the years. But depending on what the role you're going to, you need to tailor that. Don't just submit a standard resume. Gotcha. Okay. So you have found a job you've located that you want to apply for. You got your resume ready to go. Like you mentioned salary. Like what do we need to do in order to <laughs> prep for salary? And just there's a prep, but then there's also the conversation of knowing when to discuss it. Yep. So before you even start applying, right? Because I don't want you to get caught off guard when someone responds to an application to talk to you. As Black women, you need to have an understanding of what your compensation expectation is, first and foremost. Know what that number is that you need, that you want, that you know that you earn, and then add $20,000 to it. So that when you go into these conversations, uh, when you're giving that expectation, you're going to give the higher end that some company more than likely is going to talk you down on. And they're going to tell you, oh, well, that's out of our budget. Great. Well, what is your budget since that's out of it? Talk to me about your budget. <laughs> I've given you right. my expectations. You're telling me they're out of budget. The role sounds interesting and could be perfect, but what is your budget for it? oh, we could probably do this. And that actually might hit my expectation. And, I, and then that's when you say, you know, thanks for the transparency. I'm interested in seeing this further and we can talk again about compensation if there is a match. But at least you stated the conversation with what your expectation is and you've given yourself a little bit of a bumper. I will tell you that companies aren't out to get you. Let me just clarify that. They're not, oh, really? trying, to, they're not trying to squeeze you. Let me tell you what they're doing. And, and, and the thing about salary bands that make them interesting is that there's also a level of retention tied into those. 
And so if I were to hire you at the max of my band, right? If I'm a manager and I hire you at the absolute max because you were that great and you were that good. I have to ask myself, is that really what I need for this position? The second question is, if I hire her, how do I retain her? Because I'm hiring her at the top of the band and I'm not going to be able to retain her in that, in that atmosphere. What I like to do then, if I'm the recruiter supporting that manager, right? And I have a candidate who's awesome. I know she's good. She far out exceeds expectations and we're, we're going to hit the top of the band. That yeah. probably tells me that you're somewhere in between and we potentially should be leveling up this role, right? So oh, whether you nice. were applying for a senior manager, perhaps it's a, it's a director that we should really be considering you for and see where that growth is. How far off are you skill set wise from and can it be taught in the next 12 to 18 months? If so, we've got you in the wrong band. Wow, okay. There's so much more on the other side. I had There's no so idea much more. And, and the thing about it is recruiters don't tell candidates this. So candidates don't know and they feel like you're just gatekeepering me or you're just trying to trying to hold me down. Well, the reality yeah. is no, there's no explanation for the outside of, I've either brought a candidate who's better than what my manager needed for this job and now I need to uh -huh. sell them into leveling it up to hire you and, make, and hoping they have the budget to do so or I'm gonna have to let you go and find actually someone probably with less skills than you who actually match what we're looking for today. That's the hard Got reality it. of what we're doing. And I see Shauna says, cause recruiters ain't shit. You're probably <laughs> right about that. Y'all are working with some shitty recruiters, but I hope we can, uh, we can, we can actually help to elevate the industry and help uh, other recruiters learn that it's through these transparent conversations with candidates that will actually allow them to build trust. And it could very well be that, hey, this role that I got for you is going to be tight. And if and if we bring you in this high, you got to know that you're not going to get a raise in probably two or three years. Are you, is that what you want? Yeah. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah. You know, okay. having that transparent conversation. But then, Roz, let me let me paint another scenario for you because because for someone who doesn't have that wisdom that you have knowing that and they go, but I really want this role and I really want to work in that. So I'm fine with being at the top of that band but like, let's talk about equity and other things that can be kind of negotiated in salary. Yeah, and that's actually, so you'll have more leverage. I'll be honest, you have more leverage with, with negotiation on equity and sign-ons. And here's okay. why. The, my peers, so I'm, I'm t talent acquisition, I'm recruiting. There's another side to this that you all don't see, and that's HR. And HR's side of this is they have to maintain parity amongst the internal equity of a team. So if I'm gonna go hire you, and then you throw off parity with the whole team, now they have a whole other job to do, right? So there's a balancing act that we have to play as companies. I think the thing is that with equity and a sign-on bonus, that's not considered compensation. Did you know that? That's not considered your salary. And so I can pay you a salary that keeps you the same as others, but maybe we look at uh, flexing the equity grant or adding more of a sign-on bonus to offset you in year one to help you make that transition tends to be an easier thing to get a company to say yes to than to up your base salary. Okay, okay. So we've got resume, we've got salary prep that we need to do, and that's how we can help our- But I gotta, hold, I gotta go back to salary prep because I didn't give you enough sure. tools. I wanna make sure you guys know. When I say know your expectations, you might not know what you're worth in the marketplace because you've only been paid what you've been paid. And we're not having open conversations peer to peer to say, Hey, what are you making as a product manager? I'm looking at a job right now at Disney and they're offering XYZ. Is that a good offer? Yeah. So there are tools out there though. So one tool that I send all my friends to is the CNN money uh, relocation calculator. Especially wow. if they're moving from like Seattle to San Francisco or LA to the Bay. We will say yes to a salary because it's higher than what we, what we wanted and not realizing that it's lower for that market. And so yep. the CNN money cal re calculator tool will help you to look at what am I making in this city and how would that translate in another city? Or I'm looking to make 80K in LA, that might be 140 in San Francisco. And so right. if I don't know that, when I go into negotiation, I'm asking for 90 or 100 and thinking that's You're a, happy about that. And I'm happy about it. And then I go up there and I try to rent a shoebox for $3,000 a month and I can't, you know, can't even eat now. Right. So yeah. that's, that's one tool I wanna give to you guys. The other tool that I wanted to share with you that I don't think we use thoroughly enough is Glassdoor. I think we go to Glassdoor and then we leave, you know, but you really got to dig into those reviews. Dig into the good reviews, dig into the bad reviews, dig into the benefit section because that's part of compensation. 
like what is important to you write it down like for me i'll give you guys just full transparency before i took this job what was important to me was of course the money i didn't care about the equity anymore uh, equity is fine but I've, I've done the startup hustle and I and I managed my money pretty well so I was looking for a higher base and bonus structure I was really really combing through benefits because my wife and I want to have a child so I wanted a company that's gonna pay for that child so you have to have a yes. great fertility benefit yeah. for same-sex couples that was huge for me and then lastly I needed to know about the growth potential and the diversity at those levels that I was looking for so that's what mattered to me. So when I was looking at the compensation that I was being offered, I looked at it from the lens of cash on hand and benefits. How do these benefits support the lifestyle that I want? So I wanna make sure that you guys are really digging into the tools. Um, also, if you want it, it's a paid resource. So I feel sketch about putting it out here, but it's really good for women of color and it's 88cents.com. It is one that is actively always doing surveys with employers to understand what they're paying at different levels, different roles. So if you're willing to pay a small price, I think it's 20 bucks or so, depending on the type of subscription you choose, they will help you negotiate an offer and tell you if it's below uh, market for that company or not. So that's another good one. Okay, so it's not just about how do I get in the door of the job, it's really like evaluating my confidence and like what am I worth and what's important to me before I even start that conversation. Okay. I'll so, send you these right. via email later too so you can have the actual links yeah, to the site. You know, I'm in gym, but I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, everyone, that concludes part one of this series. I hope you'll stay tuned for next week.